Well, now it will be Pedro Rodrigues from Cloudware. Morning, everyone. Uh, okay, after three and a half years, we're going to look back at our first web application development, the problems we faced, and the solutions we found. But first, a little backstory. We started developing in 2012, in September, on Ruby on Rails 3.2. It was a stable version at the time. I know now we have Rails 5, but we didn't have any time to upgrade it yet. We used PostgreSQL 9.1, and we later upgraded it to 9.4. We started with three developers, and we only had three months to develop this application. Three and a half years in, the project is now about 10 times bigger, both in complexity and in terms of features. We have about 40,000 companies using our application, with 70,000 users registered. And now we have eight developers working from maintenance, new features, server, administration, everything. So, first problem we faced, printing documents. Our printing components have a few requirements. It needed to generate digitally signed PDFs. We have a legal obligation for every document that comes out of our platform to be digitally signed. It needed to support several templates because not everyone likes the, the, same, uh, the same look on their invoices and if possible, it needed to be free. Okay. We looked at some options. First, we looked at PDF Kit. It's a Ruby gem that allows you to convert HTML and CSS templates into PDF, but it turned out to be very limited for our needs. Pentaho, it's pretty much a business intelligence tool, but it was overly complex. Uh, very difficult to, to manage and to install, so we discarded that as well. And finally, we, found, we found Jasper Reports. It's an open source reporting server uh, that can also be integrated as a library into your code. It supports templates written in XML and allows you to connect to very different data sources. So we had found our solution. But it's written in Java, and our application uses Ruby. So how do we do this? We found this little gem called RGB, which stands for Ruby Java Bridge. And it allows you to, to use Java objects and call Java methods from your Ruby code. It was great. We started developing our code around this gem. We tried it in our, our development machines. And we had a bit, a bit of problem with the first request, which is normal because the Java virtual machine needs to be loaded. It, takes, it took about 30 seconds to print the first document, but the, the other ones, the rest, were all printed very fast. So we deployed our code to our staging server, and we made our first print, print request, and we got back a segmentation fault. Great. RGB, at the time we, we were in 2012, didn't work in Linux systems. So we had to find a solution that would allow us to use all the work we had made until then, and not discard everything last one month of work. So we figured out a way. We extracted our printing code to a separate executable. Looking back, we should have, have expected the result. It would work great, but every print request that we made took the whole 30 seconds, because the Java virtual machine had to be loaded every single time. So this was not a good solution. Second solution, we found a way to keep the Java virtual machine loaded. We extracted our printing code to a separate web application. We deployed it alongside our main web application, and we started printing our documents. As, as before, the first print request took the, the initial 30 seconds to load the Java virtual machine, but all the other requests were pretty fast, around 100 milliseconds, until, until we started printing documents that were hundreds of pages long. At that point, Jasper Reports just couldn't cope with, um, with the size of the documents that needed to be printed and started taking 
longer every time. So this, which was a, a great solution for about two years, needed to be substituted. So we developed our own custom print server written in C++ that parsed the Jasper reports template and generated the PDF just like Jasper did. And now we have a great solution that since it was custom made, it, it was optimized for the large uh, documents. And now we have 100 millisecond response time for every printable document. Now, um, a problem that everyone ends up facing sooner or later, performance. In our project, we use active record. Uh, anyone who works with Rails knows about this. It's Rails default ORM. And it's great when you start a new project because it simplifies a lot of the work you have to do with the database. Uh, it's uh, like all other ORMs. It's very simple to use. It's very generic. And that causes a bit of a problem once your project grows in complexity. You can easily get overwhelmed at the number of queries that it makes to the database. And in our case, we use a grid component that requires us to feed it JSON data in a very specific format. We have to send the records to show in a results array. Then we have two total fields, one for the filter data and in, in, uh, the other for the total amount of records. And in case we need group data, we have two other fields. This means that for each, uh, for each time we need to fill up the grid, we need to do at least three queries. One for the results themselves, the second for the number of total uh, records that were found with the filters, the third one for the number of records that are available for that grid. If we actually need group data, we need to do even more queries. And even though these queries are pretty fast, the, the sheer number of queries we have to do adds up and the response time is slow. So we have to, to find a way to make this faster. Our first solution was to discard active record. Our request initially was something like this. We used active record scopes to, to get the data from the database and we re relied on active records JSON conversion tools to get the JSON data. For a simple request that returns about 20 rows, this would instantiate easily over 1,000 documents, uh, objects ranging from documents, document lines, customers, addresses, everything that we needed. And most of these objects we, won't, we would only need for one field. So what we did we do? We discarded this all together and we started moving the, the queries to the database using stored procedures. And with this, we reduced our initial response time from six seconds to around 300 milliseconds, which was around 20, 20 times increase in speed. But this, this wasn't still enough, because if we look at a query that is executed by this request, we see that the WHERE clause is applied to all the records returned from that stored procedure. As the data in the database grows, uh, this can take advantage of the, the optimizations and the indexes we have on the <coughs> database, and this query takes longer and longer to process. So our solution was to push the application of these filters into the start procedure itself. Since we now use PostgreSQL 9.4, we can use uh, JSON data and we can parse the, the, um, the filters inside the start procedure and now we can take advantage of the indexes, uh, the, the, the Postgres query planner and we now have a very stable response time at around 150 milliseconds, no matter the number of records in the database. So our slow queries problem is a bit fixed. We can still improve it by making less queries, but for now, it's good. So in the, in the start of this year, we launched our accounting module. And we knew that with this module, the data the, the amount of that in our database would grow a lot, a lot more than it had grown until now. So we decided to share the database. We knew from previous experience that once you, you, the number of records in a single table 
reaches a certain threshold, the, the queries start taking so long that your whole database slows down. So we needed to avoid that, that problem. So we charted each company's data to its own schema, and thus we were able to, re to keep the, the table sizes slow, and on the other hand, we isolated it, each company's data to make sure no bleeding occurs. But, as usual, some problems came to light. Our application started taking much longer to load and started taking up much more memory, and our process from, for making database backups started failing. <coughs> Looking at the first problem, from the initial 30 seconds boot time we had, we, are we were now taking over more than four minutes to load up our application. And from 300 megabytes of memory that our application took initially, we were now over two gigabytes of memory for each Rails process. This was particularly <coughs> troublesome for two reasons. Uh, we have a habit of making very small hotfixes every day. And once we deploy a new, up, uh, new application code, we would hang our application for about four minutes and our clients started, our customers started complaining a lot. And our uh, background process monitoring tool was configured to uh, restart any worker that took up more than two gigabytes of memory. This means that we came to a point where our 15 background project processes would um, keep going into a restart loop. And since Rails uh, occupies much more CPU in the beginning while it's loading up the whole framework, we were effectively DDoS in our own system. And this is why. Rails Database Adapter has a habit of mapping every object it can find in the database. So it can work with active record. It can load and save the, the objects. This means that at 97, 9,700 uh, companies using this module and 100, 160 tables per schema, we were talking about 1.5 million objects that Rails was loading into, into its memory. But we didn't use active record with this model. So why were we letting it load it? We delved into Rails code and found a bit of code that would load all the objects from the database into memory. So we discarded these schemas that we were creating, and we kept only PG catalog for the simple, simple types, the text, the, the integers, the floats, and the public schema, which is a, a Postgres default schema, for the active record models we were actually using. And we solved, we solved the problem, loading the, 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 the whole database into memory, and we now have the, the the initial 300 megabytes and 30 seconds load up time. The second problem, our backups. As is expected, we have regular backups set up for our database. We initially did four daily backups at several times, uh, at different times each day. We replicate our master database into a slave to have a, a, a fail safe and each of those backups is copied to a, a hard drive in the local network. Once per day, we copy one of those backups to an off-site hard drive, just to make sure in case a disaster happens, we have a, a recent backup. And this started failing, why? Again, with the number of databases, in the, the number of tables in the database, the Postgres PG dump utility that we were using uh, started taking too long. From we, we did the backup initially at around one hour, it took about one hour to, to complete, and now it's taking over, I, I believe the last time I measured it was 36 hours. The object dependency calculation alone takes more than 16 hours now to complete before the, 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 the actual dump takes place. And this is, this is impossible. We have to stop the replication while the dump is taking place, and then we have to stop making backups to let the replication uh, get up to date with the master. This is impractical. So what we did, we made another slave, an offsite slave, and we replicated from the, our current slave to, to keep the, the master database only for, 
for the, the serve only the application. And now we do a physical backup from the slave to keep locally, and we do another physical backup from the offsite slave to have an offsite backup. Uh, this solved our problem. Uh, we now have two replicas, which is better than we had before. But we still only have one backup per day. It's the best, it's the best we can do for now. Uh, we have a, a better uh, restore scenario, since now we can restore for, to any time, any point in the day. Uh, but yeah, only one backup per day. We are constantly trying to speed up our application. And one, one of the best ways to do that is to reduce the amount of queries that hit the database. <coughs> Either by refactoring our codes, uh, eliminating unneeded queries, or merging queries that, that can be merged. And as most of you, or everyone knows, HTTP is stateless which means that every request must perform a series of setup steps like user authentication, request authorization, loading the, re the current request context. And that, those are steps that you can't avoid. And most of these steps actually uh, make a lot of queries to the database. So what did we do to reduce this, these queries on the database? We offloaded most of this, of this data to a cache server. We already had a, a ready server in place because of our background processes. And we took the, the data that was loaded on every request and we sent it to Redis. We cached the current user data, the, the current user permissions, the current company data. And we got, we achieved the milestone. We got a single Rails request that doesn't hit the database. This request periodically checks the user's pending notifications and the, the, the user's current notifications and the pending background job, job for the company. And we made this request 20 times faster. From the initially 60, 600 milliseconds the request took, it was now taking less than 30 <coughs> milliseconds to complete. And this reduced the, also reduced the load on the database in a, for about 10%, which was great. But again, this was not perfect. There were two problems. First, we can't have stale cache data in our server. We need, very, we need to be very careful while keeping the cache fresh. When we update our database, we have to update the cache. <coughs> and the amount of cache data that we are now uh, transferring between our cache server and our web servers is so big that we created a bottleneck on the, on the network, on the internal network. And this actually canceled the performance improvement we had with, uh, with sending the cache data, sending the data to the cache. <coughs> so our solution for this, create a master slave Redis cluster. We use our current server as the master and we install the slave uh, server into each of our web servers. Redis has a, a very optimized synchronization algorithm and since our cache is pretty, st pretty stable, it's intensively red, but it's not very usually changed. This was perfect, as the, the bottleneck that we had in the, in the network was eliminated by Redis alg uh, synchronization algorithm. The changes are propagated immediately, or almost immediately, and since the, this algorithm is so optimized, the, the bandwidth impact is negligible. But again, Rails doesn't support master-slave connections out of the box. So we had to implement our own adapter. We are now using a very simple uh, Rails master-slave adapter that opens uh, two connections, one to the master and one to the slave. And once we get a request from Rails, it redirects any writes to the master and any reads to the, to the slave. It is, it's been working great. It's very simple. It's not, uh, it's just simple redirect, redirecting of methods, but it works great for our case. So, where do we go from here? We are constantly trying to, 
to figure ways to, to get our application to respond faster. As partly as a joke, partly as a goal, we keep saying that our application should run at 60 frames per second. This means that each request must take at, at most 16 milliseconds. Okay, it's difficult with all the network conditions, but it's a goal. So what we're doing now, we are improving, upgrading our print server, our custom print server to support edition using WebSockets connecting to a JSON API service. For that reason, we, we de developed our JSON API service as a start procedure written in C directly into the database. This means that we can send the request directly to a start procedure. We, send, we can send the, the actual URL that's being requested directly to the, the, um, the database, and we get a JSON API response from that query. Here we have our current, uh, let's call it stack, of, of a request. <coughs> the, the, the web application communicates via WebSockets with our Nginx proxy server that proxies that connection to Rails which in turn talks to the database. Our controller for a request of this type is as simple as this. We just call our data set adapter with the, the parameters we need and it responds with JSON. But still, we feel Rails isn't fast enough for our needs. So what we are working now is to make Nginx talk directly to to the database in order to, re to remove what is effectively a very thick layer in this stack. I can't go into details because it, this is in a very early stage, but it's the next, the next step in reducing our speed, in reducing, no, improving our speed. Thank you for putting up with me. If you have any questions. Just a quick question. Uh, with all these changes that you had to do in, to Active Record or ignoring Active Record and other things, do you still think that you're, do you still have a Rails, Rails application? Do you think it's still worth to keep with a Rails application? What is your point of view after all these challenges? Uh, I think after all this time, I, I've been more net of an advocate for Rails and Active Record than I am now, honestly. Uh, I, I still think Active Record is great. I think I still think Rails is great. I don't think we'll ever uh, get away completely from Rails, but we are actually moving away from Rails in where we where we can and where it's possible. Uh, because, like I said, Rails isn't isn't fast enough. It's it's very heavy. It's, you need a lot of hardware to, for it to respond fast, and sometimes it's really not enough. I think it's pretty much that uh, I was, for, for a very long time, I had several discussions with my colleagues because they, they come from another world, they come from the sea world, and uh, not sea as in <coughs> ocean, <laughs> sea world, um, uh, and they loathe, completely loathe active, active record, and now I'm starting to agree a bit with, uh, with them because we c you can take advantage of the, the database uh, advanced features. You can't use triggers with, with Active Record. You, al you always have to go around Active Record for, for several things. I, th I, th I think we are going to, to, to start skipping Rails as much as possible. Thank you. Over there. There's an, another one in the back. The strange guy with the blue shirt. We 
don't want to hear. If only we had some, someone who knew, who knew about technology here. <laughs> that would be amazing. A yellow shirt guy will solve the problem. Hi. Hi, good morning. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, what is your uh, main concern with the performance of the application? Is it the user experience that was bad, or is it a question of server costs? Because uh, you sure lose a lot by uh, breaking the, the abstractions given to you by Rails and talking directly with the database, right? Yeah, it's pretty much user experience. Database costs, we, we, have, we have very low database, uh, database no, uh, server costs. We have very low da uh, server costs. So our main concern is, is user experience. We, like I, I said in the, in the end, uh, we are working now uh, in making a, a very fast document edition, for example, that works with web sockets and all the calculations are server side. So you can have uh, almost a, de a desktop-like experience while working on the web. Uh, our concern is purely, purely user experience. We want to have a desktop-like experience in the, in, in the web. And wouldn't uh, uh, do some computations on the client instead of always talking with the server be a, a possible solution? We, we have several places where we have to do server-side uh, computations. For example, our, our application is a, an ERP system. Uh, we have to make invoices. For, uh, in, in those invoices, while you're, you're filling the invoice, while you're adding, uh, adding items to your invoice, you have calculations done on the, on, on the client side. But still, to be safe, you have to do those calculations server-side as well. You can't rely on, on client-side uh, data to be completely correct, and it, uh, it can be hackable. Once it's, once it's on your side, it can be hackable. Once it's on the server side, it's more difficult to hack. It's not impossible, but, but at least it's, more, it's safer to have the calculations done on the server side. Um, I, can't, I can't exactly tell you that we can't have client-side uh, computations. But you, ca you can't, you, you will always need to have server-side. Okay. Anyone else? No? Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you.